Thank you so much, Paula. And so again, as I introduce our next speaker, we'll save the question and answers for these two speakers after Dr. Knopfel talks. But if you have any questions for Paula, please write them down. We got those boards, we got those pens, write down a word that comes to mind or a question so we don't miss it so we can actually get to that. So let me introduce our next speaker. Dr. Janice E. Knopfel has been practicing medicine as a neurologist and geriatrician for over 40 years. She was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio, graduated from Ohio State University School of Medicine, and is trained in internal medicine, neurology, geriatric neurology, and public health. She holds her MD, Doctor of Medicine, and MPH, Master of Public Health, and has been on the faculty of the University of Cincinnati, Boston University, and in 1996, she started her current position as faculty here at the University of New Mexico as a professor of geriatric medicine and neurology. She specializes in care of individuals with neurological diseases associated with aging, most importantly, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. She lectures on prevention, risk factors, precursors to aging, and the devastating effects of dementia. For the last nine years, she has been the director of the Center for Memory and Aging Clinic at UNM's Health Sciences Center, and in 2020, she became the co-director of the administrative core of the New Mexico Alzheimer's Disease Research Center funded by the National Institute of Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Janice Knopel to the floor. Um, it's wonderful to be here this afternoon, and uh, thank you, um, uh, City of Albuquerque uh, Senior Affairs, for inviting me and actually organizing this whole thing. This is great. Um, so um, I'm looking out into the audience, and I'm seeing a couple of familiar faces. Uh, Anna, of course, Agnes, Kathleen from Oasis, uh, Cindy, how do you do? Um, Andrew, uh, Lynn from the state, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Sanchez. How do you do? So um, I'm going to be talking about ageism in healthcare. I've been in healthcare uh, for a long, long time, and I um, sometimes I do like. Well, a lot of times I like to reflect back on my own journey as to what I have been seemingly almost destined to be. Um, when I was uh, a child, like third, fourth grade, um, my mom let me go into the neighborhood and knock on the doors. I knew where all the older people lived, and I wanted to go in and talk to them. Well, actually, they talked to me, but I learned a lot. I didn't really say all that much, <laughs> but they were, they were very nice, and they usually sent me off with a little bit of a candy, you know. So it was, it was that, and I traced my interest in geriatrics way, way, way back to those um, to those days, um, and I've you know, knocked on the doors of nursing homes when I was a teenager, and I said, can I just come in and talk to some of your people? They go, oh yeah, sure, this is great. So I have, have it's kind of, I don't know how, I, how that happened to me, but it was just by far the, I think the most interesting segment of any population I had ever met before, and that's where I wanted to end up. Um, and indeed, that's exactly where I did end up. So I'm happy to be here um, today uh, talking to you. So what is ageism in healthcare? What is it? Does it affect our health? And what can we do about it? So ageism is widespread in healthcare around the world. I like to think perhaps more uh, in other countries than in our own, uh, perhaps. Um, there are many countries in this world who really don't have all that many old people. Not yet, I mean, we're, they're accumulating them over time. Um, this ageism can affect every aspect of healthcare and making the diagnosis and in treatment um, and also actually in prognosis. Prognosis means once we have an illness, can we try to predict how that illness is going to affect us over time? So that's also very important. Um, it, um, ageism in influences healthcare policies and workplace culture for sure. We see it every day. Um, and it certainly may influence the behavior of individual care professionals as well, either um, you know, implicit or explicit. So, um, the, there are inaccurate perceptions of aging um, in, in our own healthcare teams. 
right? So lack of knowledge about aging leads to ageism in healthcare settings. I mean, there are some people, um, young, younger people, who really haven't known that many older people, and they may or may not know what to expect from their own experience, but they have sometimes preconceived ideas of how, how, how we should act um, and how we should be, actually. Um, lack of knowledge, knowledge about the normal aging process can result in what we see here. Um, potential for inappropriate medical care, uh, too little, but also too much at times. Um, how about uh, the healthcare uh, staff spending less time with their older patients? Um, and perhaps they're not really engaging that person in conversation when they are um, taking care of them, either in the hospital or in the clinic. Um, it can be associated with shorter, less effective, and more superficial communication, and that's not really the way to help um, people understand um, what's going on with their health. Um, in one study, and, and there actually have been a fair number of studies about this, doctors who were less patient, respectful, and involved in, with the care of their older patients it resulted in you know, changes um, in the way that they treat their patients and how they approach them and how they treat them. And it's not necessarily based purely on medical needs, which it should be as well. Um, so how, how does this look in practice? Now, I like to think that I really don't see it much um, because I work in uh, the geriatric clinic at, at UNMH, I work in the Memory and Aging Clinic at UNH, um, and people, our staff, our you know even our receptionists, were used to working with older people. So we don't. I hope I like to think we don't give people that attitude, but I can see it in other practices, namely when I go into my own primary care. Okay, here it is. But I, I, I don't lecture them, believe me. So what, what are we seeing? We're seeing um, elders speak. And you may not know about this, but you will probably recognize it when you see it. It's oversimplified language. Um, sometimes the terms of endearment, like deary or sweetie, um, which just drives me crazy. And also kind of that rhythmic tone of voice. Well, you know, let's see what we can do with you today. You know, what's bothering you? I mean, this, this, this kind of, that's not the way, that's not good communication. Um, it, and it's really um, kind of betraying the, what the underlying um, attitude of the, of the provider is towards, towards the um, older individual. So elder speak is definitely patronizing, and it reinforces that unequal power relationship between professionals and the people they care for, as well as, well as even the caregivers um, for um, the individuals. It may be seen, um, especially seen in individuals who may be perceived as having cognitive decline. And that's what we try to prevent, you know, in our memory and aging clinics at UNM. Um, and interestingly, Interestingly enough, we can also see that same attitude with individuals who may need a, a language uh, interpreter. You know, different languages can also engender that type of um, attitude, unfortunately. So, um, how about the outcomes uh, for um, older individuals? Well, um, there is an assumption, and I'm, I'm already smiling because I'm going to give some good incidences here. The assumption that older um, patients are less independent, just automatically based on your age, which is absolutely not correct, um, they, that assumption may result in unnecessary activity restrictions, such as you, know, you can't get out of your, your bed or your chair without assistance, because the assumption is you can't do it. But that's incorrect for the most part. And of course, excessive bed, bed rest itself can also lead to a complication such as um, um, what, the, what they call um, inability to continue our muscle tone, you know, disuse atrophy. If we, if we stay in bed for, for 24 hours, our muscles are already starting to atrophy. We need to get up and move around. Um, social workers in cancer care have been documented to spend less time 
with um, older uh, patients that they care for compared to younger people. Uh, I, I don't know who, who needs more care. It's not based on age. It's often based upon perhaps personality and their own in emotional needs, um, but it's definitely not based on age. Um, and younger people do, younger people potentially have more to lose and grieve than older people? I don't think so. That is ageism. So how about coercion? Sometimes it's, it's very clear, again, in healthcare, that both younger and older people may actually face some coercion in healthcare due to the perception that their feelings do not matter. In other words, we may not ask what a person would like or try to discuss it, you know, what their own preferences are. We just assume, okay, th you know, this is what we need to do. Well, that's really not the way to establish a good, a good working relationship with your patients. Um, and I actually, my professional experience is often the flip side of that. We have young people coming in and, you know, they're having aches and pains and they'll say, oh, I'm just getting old. And I'm thinking, oh, you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Um, so these young individuals with ageist beliefs, they have higher rates of certain diseases as they age. And certainly depression is one, um, cardiovascular uh, disease, memory loss, and lower will to live. Um, and I, I don't know where that attitude comes from in our younger people when they think they're already aged. Um, I'm still figuring that out. Um, Young people with ageist beliefs, they often skip screening, you know, diagnostic uh, procedures if offered to them and sometimes treatment of, tr treatment of treatable illness because they think they're just getting old. They don't recognize that some of the symptoms are actually due to an illness and that it can be, um, we can put a name to it and we can tell you what, what we should do about it. And it does, it does affect everyone. Um, we know that there are higher rates of, of physical and mental illness as we age. Um, and mental illness is predominantly depression, uh, sometimes anxiety. Uh, it's not so much the psychosis and um, uh, schizophrenia, that kind of thing. It's really more in the, um, in the feeling, the affective uh, depression um, area. It's um, sometimes it's associated with risk-taking behaviors. If you say, oh, I'm getting old, what do I have to look forward to? So I'm just going to live for today, which you know, includes drinking alcohol and having the cigarettes we, we just talked about, poor diet, you know, the, the old, you know, you only live, you only live once. But, you know, we like to think that it's high quality and it's going to be a long life, hopefully. So um, we know that in individuals who have ages and beliefs, that that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. prophecy. The, those individuals have a lower a life expectancy by up to seven and a half years. And that does tell us the effect of um, attitude and uh, lack of optimism on, on, on life. So there is a definite connection with poverty and we should really also um, emphasize this as well, um, because it's not only just our innate um, philosophy of life and our mood. I mean, it can be influenced also by our circumstances, perhaps that we're born into or that we live with. So such things as poverty, um, um, if a person has poor quality health insurance, that's going to lead to um, lower um, uh, use of the screening opportunities that we have in healthcare these days, which will then perhaps engender an increased uh, incidence of actual diagnoses and, and illnesses and um, disability and death, if you play that out over a whole lifespan. Um, this is especially prevalent in retired, disabled, and unmarried or non-partnered persons. And again, the, sci the sociologists have looked at this and said, you know, who is most likely to kind of fit into these categories, and it's um, those individuals. So we know, we've just heard, uh, thank you, Paula, uh, the number of older adults in this, in this country are growing and across the whole world, actually, and ageism is an importantly, uh, increasingly important issue for us in healthcare. So how do we stop? 
How do we try? How do we try to stop it? How do we identify it? Well, the World Health Organization, who is very interested in this, they a lot of this of what I'm quoting today is from the World Health Organization. They um, they've come up with um, three ways uh, to really combat the ageism in healthcare. And it has to do with education, again, not a surprise, education to dispel, to dispel myths and stereotypes, and to um, also raise the awareness of the impact um, of aging that it has on our health care and our attitudes. Um, what they have found to be very effective, actually, are the intergenerational in, um, interventions, which really create um, cooperation and empathy between the age group. And I, I know we, uh, especially here in Albuquerque, we have a lot of this going on, actually, um, in, the, uh, in the schools. And I know that OASIS ha especially has a program uh, matching um, older uh, volunteers uh, with, um, with, our, with our schools. I don't think it's necessarily restricted to elementary, but a lot of it is, you know, in, into the, to the lower um, grades. And of course, we also can look at, we need to look at um, a law and policy changes um, so that we can identify inequity and discrimination and then really try to uh, address those issues. Okay, so we, now th this is not a political statement, <laughs> if you know who this is. So just, and I chose uh, uh, Mr. Murdoch because he just announced that he was stepping down from his uh, company there at uh, Fox. Well, uh, Mr. Murdoch is 92 years old, and that's remarkable um, that he has, you know, ha has been able to build his, his business. I suspect he's still going to remain active. He's handing it over to his, uh, his I think it's his oldest son or something. So he, he I know from just watching him, you know, on the, um, you know, on the world stage, in the U.S. stage, that he will remain active. And I don't think he's going to go... Um, retire, actually. Um, so his statement is, for my entire professional life, I have been engaged daily with new ideas and news, of course. That will not change, but the time is right for me to take on a different role. So I'm interested to see how he is going to um, fare in his quote-unquote quote, quote retirement. So, so um, can we take action against ageism in healthcare? And the answer is yes. We have to become aware of ageism and how it shapes our thoughts, feelings, and life experiences and do some reflection, which is really, I think, one of the purposes of this uh, symposium today. We're, we need to learn about the whole idea of ageism and how it affects others by listening to personal stories, reading books, and um, researching. And I'll just give you a little personal um, experience. So um, here at UNM, we have the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and it's a National Institute of Aging funded uh, multi-year project. We just finished our first three years and we uh, are applying for the next five years. And if we get this, it will be an award of $22 million, which is really fabulous to have that amount of money to be able to study you know, um, aging, uh, dementia, and also Alzheimer's, of course. Well, the leader, of us all at UNM in this endeavor. He is celebrating his 80th birthday this year. And we look to our leader as a real inspiration for us. And we, we, keep, we keep looking behind ourselves and saying, where are the younger people? We need younger people in this field. So I'll give you updates as, as things go along. We should hear, and hopefully in November, if we're going to be able to continue with our research um, here in New Mexico um, regarding the Alzheimer's. So um, we need to um, develop skills, learning about and practice advocacy skills, such as knowing when to speak up and when to, when to step back. We can speak up if it's appropriate, but we don't want to speak over um, our elders. We do not, our older people, we do not want to do that. We need to listen and ask for opinions. And uh, again, in the healthcare where the, you know, the dynamic between the doctor and the, you know, patient or not, it's not always equal. Well, I tried to, I tried to equalize that and really get that communication going. We can take action, try, try correcting ageist stereotypes, 
And I, I, I'm smiling because um, one of my encounters with uh, one of the medical students just recently, you know, we're talking about dementia, and his question was, well, tell me, I have a question. How does this differ from the usual dementia of old age? And there is no usual dementia of old age, so that was a real learning, learning opportunity for us. But it, it, we, we hear it even, even today. Um, and of course, um, this does not involve rescuing people. We need to support and advocate, advocate for them. Um, in situations where they're struggling to be heard. And this is, again, I, I see this almost every day in my work with, um, with Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline. You know, we have to listen. What I would do is not always what they will do, and I will support them in that. Okay, and I think, so th these, these uh, my last two slides have to do with something that is really tangible, you know. So um, I'm sure most people here have heard about the palliative care and the hospice movement. You know, uh, every hospital in this state now has uh, palliative care and hospice. UNM has taken, of course, the leadership in this, and we do um, a lot of training. We have a fellowship. We're training new, younger physicians from all, all aspects of, of medical care. We have you know, individuals coming over from cancer, not just geriatrics, we, have, we, we work with pediatricians because they deal with this as well. So, so what is, in particular, palliative care? It's an approach that improves the quality of life for patients and their families facing life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification, assessment, treatment of pain, and other problems, and that includes a physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. So we have a very strong um, hospice organization um, you know, at UNM and also in the community. There are lots of community-based hospices as well. Um, they, um, this movement has really gained traction in the United States just since about in the 1980s. It started over in England right after World War II, um, and there's a, a great history to that as well. And there are a number of hospital-based and community-based hospice organizations. So this is the last slide I have, and this is, this is really something new. And this is called Medical Aid in Dying. And that might sound a little inflammatory at times, but it is available for individuals who are facing end of life in New Mexico. So that means you don't necessarily have to go through the palliative care hospice approach you can take this you know, into your own hands with, with medical oversight, of course, and you can decide you know, to how you are going to live out your life. How, how are you going to die? So this is pretty, this can be controversial. Um, and and um, again, these um, laws are state by state, and here in New Mexico, we've had it since June of 2021. So this is really a brand new thing for us. And it's, for some people, it is a logical step for individuals facing end-of-life decisions to make on how and when and, and what setting as well. So we would have control over um, our final chapter, if you will. Um, and there are, again, some, um, uh, there's a reference there for you. And I myself consider that hospice and the new program medical aid in dying is really an integral part of the ageism uh, discussion that we can have re in re regards to, um, to uh, health care. So I'll be happy to have questions and further discussions. So thank you so much. Hello. Yeah. 
Um, hi, Terry Schlater. Uh, I work with groups um, with community health workers who work with aging populations uh, of folks who don't often have access to, to your services, doctor. And I'm wondering, uh, how can we make services more accessible to, um, to non-English speakers, but also folks who have a hard time getting even on Medicaid? But they live here and they pay taxes. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm assuming that you're speaking about mostly individuals who live in the rural areas? No? Oh. So this is a larger discussion about really access to health care. I mean, and I think, I mean, I think the United States has done a better and better job of that, but there are still um, a large number of individuals who don't qualify for any of those programs. Um, I don't have the answers to that, but I think it's, uh, we recognize that. I, I, I will, I will make, make mention to you that um, the hospices that I'm familiar with, they actually can provide services under kind of, a, if you will, a scholarship kind of thing, a whole, whole new meaning of scholarship. Um, but that they will, at times, I believe, you know, take on um, in the care of individuals who do not, who are not covered um, under any of the the payers, but have the need um, to do that. And I can I can I I'll, I can get some more information on that for you. Any other questions for Paula or Janice? Yeah. I must be the fly in the ointment. Um, so we talked about the fact that there's 10,000 people turning 65 every day. I can imagine working at Medicaid or Medicare and going, oh my God, today's a new day. But how do we, we're becoming less, we're becoming more and more seniors coming to a Medicare system that is on crutches. And how are we supposed to talk to people about the importance of taking care of our 65 plus when we can't, you know, even get Congress to pass a, not only a health care law, but the, you know, we don't even know if we're going to, if we're going to have a budget by Monday. <laughs> I think that's your question. <laughs> well, I you signed up for Medicare. You're, you're, the, you're the policy person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, I, you just gave my stomach and my stomach went blue because I just signed, signed up October 1st. I start Medicare. So thanks for giving me a little bit of anxiety there. Yeah, so I think that that's, a, that's um, both a um, health care system, but I think, and I think um, Janice spoke to it too, I think it's really us, it's like a lot of the policy makers are putting their head in the sand about this aging issue and the ageism. And I think it's up to, I'll do my speak, I think all of us have to continue to push with our personal, with our representatives, both in the state level and at the congressional level to make sure they're paying attention to it right and saying that we care about it and that we and i always remind them just look at who votes and you better pay attention i mean i think it's ridiculous that medicare doesn't care cover vision hearing and dental i mean those are the predetermined those are the biggest determinants to continue to have a healthy life and how long has that happened right so um, I think we all got to speak up, and it is it is a problem, absolutely. So I'm um, I'm up here smiling because I am remembering some um, instances in clinic um, where, and again, um, this was at the university when we're um, seeing a person for the first time. I'm seeing a person for the first time, and and I'll start asking um, things like, well, you know, so how was your last health checkup? And if it's a woman, she'll say, well, my last child is now 35 years old. And that possibly could have been the last time she saw a physician. 
And then for, for the gentleman, it's usually, well, um, I got out of the service in about 1963. So that was the last time. I mean, so we, we have a lot of gaps in our, in our health care coverage in this country. Um, and I, I think we can do better, and we have to get the will to do better. Okay, we'll take our last question. We'll take a break. Hi. Hi, thank you. Doctor, uh, may I ask this question? And first of all, I'd like to apologize to all the young people in this, in this room for this question, and a lot of the older people as well. But I, I think that the self-determination, you know, for, for people who have been thoughtful all, all their life about their health and environment and everything else, this self-determination, I think, should be allowed to last all the way to the last minute. And, and, and it's not necessarily based on all those other criteria that you have up, up above. Uh, may I ask your opinion about that? Well, I mean, obviously in US healthcare, self-determination takes precedence over, over everything else. And I, I, I tell you, you're making me think back to when I was a new young doctor and uh, I, we, I had some person who had a curable cancer and he decided that he did not want any treatment whatsoever. And I, I had such a hard time with that. Um, and we talked a lot, you know, we would have a dialogue back and forth and with me trying to understand what, you know, how he was feeling and what he was thinking versus, you know, um, what I really wanted to talk about was the treatment, <laughs> but uh, that, that didn't go over. So um, I think self-determination is very, very important. And it, it's really the law of the land. I mean, we're not gonna do any, we can't do things to people that they do not uh, consent to. Um, and certainly even coming to a doctor's visit is part of that consent, you know, to maybe get some more information and then make up your own mind. But we, we have, I have really long, interesting discussions with the people I take care of and their families to, address some of those issues. Can I get another round of applause for Dr. Janice and Paula?